at nine o'clock this evening. Let's go to another story now. So a former Model C school in the Eastern Cape, uh, Clarendon a Girls High School, has been rocked by allegations of institutional racism and uh, discrimination. So old girls uh, from the East London School have uh, detailed on social media alleged racism going back years as well as a culture of silence. Uh, their social media post was sparked by a letter from the school to parents of learners in the wake of the Black Lives Matter protests. Uh, in the letter, the school appealed for learners to voice uh, their concerns on Black Lives Matter in line with the school's uh, values. So an old uh, girls, uh, so old girls uh, from, who matriculated uh, from Clarendon High School in 2005. One of them joins me now, Atambile Masola. She joins me via Skype. Atambile, thank you very much indeed for your time uh, this evening. So uh, we've seen these allegations of racism and discrimination crop up at your former school. Uh, first of all, tell us about your experience there. Thanks so much for having me, Chris Alder. Um, I think it's very important to start by saying that you know, these calls, you receive a good education and it comes at a huge emotional cost and a huge psychological cost. And that meant for us living through a school that had a language policy that discriminated against the use of Isakosa, not only in the classroom, but also in the in the school field and in the playground. We had teachers who would give white girls preferential treatment over the same uh, misdemeanor from white girls um, in, in comparison to black girls, but white girls would get preferential treatment. We had cases where teachers were um, explicitly racist and there were not enough channels for us to be able to voice our concerns. We, um, the environment was often very hostile to black, colored and Indian parents who wanted to get involved in the school, but often were kind of ousted or left on the periphery in terms of getting involved in the school. So there's a long list of very discriminatory and exclusionary practices in the school. And so in, the, in light of the letter that they sent, saying that this, uh, they support Black Lives Matter, it was an opportunity for us to say, well, let's talk about what that actually means in light of our um, experiences. Yeah, so you and others uh, spoke out just recently, of course, sparked uh, by the school basically saying uh, that the learners should comment on the Black Lives Matter protests uh, on social media in accordance with the school policy. So you're basically saying this is a continuation of uh, what you have said is a silencing and nullifying of the lived experiences of students, both past, which include you, and present. Absolutely. I mean, we were very concerned with that because what it, it, it creates the impression that there's certain things that students may or may not say because it will bring the school's name into disrepute. And we know that often that idea of bringing the school's name into disrepute is the school not wanting to take responsibility to actually use this as a teachable moment rather than making people fearful about expressing themselves. So it seems absolutely quite strange that an educational institution would not have a language in order to deal with something like this at such a global level mm -hmm. that you are teaching young girls, you are teaching black women, you are teaching colored and Indian and white children. You say you're in a diverse country, but you are incapable of capturing this moment and using it as a teachable moment. So for us, it was once again that moment where they, they use and relegate and, and, and kind of fall back on the old patterns of fear and silence in a context where people are saying we will not be silent. And so our letter was in solidarity, not only yeah. for the girls currently, but also to make the school accountable for the fact that this is a long, this is a tradition, in fact, of the school. It must have been rather uncomfortable to be in a learning environment, I guess, like that. Did you attempt to raise these issues at the school at the time that you were there? Yes, we did. Um, and so uh, many of these schools will tell you they've got these channels. So, of course, you had the RCL, um, which they, was the prefect body and then the RCL. But the ways in which those structures are, are, are put together is that at any point, if a teacher feels uncomfortable, that, sh that process can be short-circuited. So there was also not much clarity as if you didn't get much joy with a certain teacher, where can you take that issue further? If your parent wrote a letter, um, often many parents, in fact, did come and want to see. And it was only when parents perhaps threatened with lawyers that their issues were, were brought forward. So it, it seems, um, you know, that there's a need to, for us to review some of those processes. And in fact, what we found with more recent years is that those processes over time have actually been used to, to to create even more fear amongst the girls. So, so the school, example, Atambile, let you know, me just get this for? straight. So are you saying that the school had brushed this behavior under the carpet for the longest time? Absolutely. 
Um, I mean, it, it, for me, so this is what we, we mean when we say systemic racism or we say institutional culture. So it's in the walls. It's in the very nature of how the school operates. So, you know, you, in the way in which the prefect body is chosen, they may say it's a very democratic process, mm. but there's an undercurrent, there's a subliminal messaging about who gets chosen for those positions and that they are seen as sort of the face of the, what, what a school should look like. Mm. And so for us, it's that we need to challenge the very institutional culture. And our hope as the old girls is to partner with the school and say, okay, you've got the, the, this moment now to use it and to account for what you've done. Speak to parents, get parents more involved Involved. I mean, up to now, we know that they've now created a committee and we want to be involved and we've been invited to be part of that process. But we also know that these processes fall by the wayside when issues like this fall off the newsreel, for example. So it's very important for us to kind of look through and assess those policies and assess those processes properly and find out why they haven't actually been able to do what they said they wanted to do in the past. Atambile, maybe you can stay on the line with us there, but we're going to bring in the Department of Education in the Eastern Cape. That Atambile Masola, of course, one of the old girls from Clarendon who's spoken about institutions racism and discrimination, which they say has been going on at the school for the longest time. Let's bring in the Eastern Cape Education Department's Chief Director of Communications, Dr. Naledi Mbude, who joins me now on the line. Dr. Mbude, thank you very much indeed for your time. So we're hearing from old girls at Clarendon that there's been uh, years of systemic racism, which has been brushed under the carpet by the management at that school. Uh, Do you know about this and are you investigating these allegations? about what is happening and fortunately we have a Facebook page in the department that follows what on in the media and we've taken the steps to start the investigations at Clarendon. We've put up a system of uh, interviewing the director of the school, the principal of the school, setting up its process on our virtual so that we the expense of the girls in there that are available right now in the school, but you think they are old enough uh, to be able to see what it is they are experiencing. So the process has started. Uh, Dr. Mbude, uh, I'm really struggling to hear you. Our line is not very clear, but uh, I know that the school principal who is in charge at that school has been there for a while. There are also allegations that the school has tried to, to brush this under the carpet for the longest time, and those who tried to raise these concerns were not taken seriously. Uh, is it only now that the department has become aware of this, uh, despite a number of these concerns that have been raised? It's important that parents are able to report whatever happens at schools to the department because if it only remains, you'll remember, Chris, that with a systemic racism or institutional racism or a claim or an allegation, it's what people believe is right that they are doing. And in the meantime, it is discrimination. It is putting the lives of those children who are there at a disadvantage. So as a department, we are now aware because it is now, nobody has gotten to report the matter to the department in the past. They might have reported to the school, but not really to the department. So I'm saying the process is put up to ensure that we hear what the learners are saying or the previous learners are saying. We haven't been heard is the first step because with institutional racism, people pretend it's what they have learned that they think is right or their attitudes so it's quite invisible in the system if you don't report it at that level hence we started the investigation of finding out whether the allegations the girls are putting through have been attended to in the past and what the school has done we've asked the principal for a report of all the incidents that have happened uh, Dr. Bode, you know, I can sort of understand uh, perhaps where the uh, old girls are coming from. I mean, I can picture a situation where uh, you are struggling to get your child into what is perceived as a Model C school. Uh, you know, there's often a saying that I will take my child out of a township school, and I say this as a township girl myself. Uh, when you get into the so-called better schools, you, you, you report these incidences, or if you don't, you fear that, uh, or if you do rather, you fear that you might even be kicked out of institutions such as this. I ask, I hear that you've asked the school uh, headmistress uh, to have a conversation on race and uh, the entire community, but surely this is not enough. When uh, surely school policies is what needs uh, to happen to, um, to be amended so that it can deal with such instances. I do want to say changing laws does not change people who met out racism to others. We have a classical case of South Africa 
we have a constitution that guarantees the rights of people and people still can continue to do these things to each other because policies on their own uh, do not change how people behave. But we so could start the there, Dr. Change, it is, is that this is why we are saying to us everything in terms of the policy because institutional racism is hidden under regulations and laws and policies and at the same time when you are not there people still do it like the comments that they are saying to learners that you are lucky to be here kind of so we have involved a process where the change is not only on the policy level because those policies must, must go remember the eastern cape is the only government department in the country that has what we call a language in education policy unit to transform the system because language and culture go together language and identity go together so if african languages are not part of our schooling system to transform the whole culture which is centered around a euro a European language therefore we started with a system because it is a system that hides these things uh, for, for people not to see uh, uh, Dr. Buda, would you mind if I brought in Atambile? She seems to disagree uh, vehemently uh, with uh, some of uh, uh, the statements that you're making. I hope you don't mind. Atambile, if you could bring, if you could just come in. I see you disagree uh, with some of uh, the measures that the department is talking about. I think the question for me, the reason why I'm just shaking my head is this question of accountability. So you say that there are these policies. So when you know that these policies haven't been followed through. So, for example, I mean, you're mentioning the language policy thing. You know that it hasn't been applied at Clarendon. What has been done by the government? We know that um, documents have been made. I mean, one of my favorite resources that I've used because I've taught um, PGCE students is I use the Section 27 handbook that deals with education and human rights. And that book is a clear document that maps out what this should look like at a policy level, right? So every, all those documents are there, but we know that it's not happening in schools. What we are not hearing from government across provinces and even at national level when it comes to this issue is what happens when it does not happen. And of course, Course, this is a, a systemic problem again how government relates to schools whether it's issues of water and sanitation at schools or it's issues of textbooks not a writing so this is also a systemic problem in how government is actually dealing this is but one fraction of a larger conversation that the thread is when ch- black children complain about the quality of education the department of education doesn't hear them uh, Dr. Mbude, uh, we're fast running out of time. I wish we had uh, more time. But how would you respond to that? Because uh, clearly, while I guess, uh, you know, especially with the, uh, the Department of Education in the Eastern Cape, which you said uh, has, is the only province that has put in that policy uh, relating to language, you, you could put all of these processes in place, but it goes back to what is happening on the ground. The lived experiences of these black girls and boys who are in these schools uh, for a so called better education, and this is how they're treated. The first thing to do is to acknowledge that pain has happened. There are, there are young people there who have felt the pain of being excluded, pain of being. Uh, uh, Acknowledge the pain. And that pain is not just residing in one school, it resides in the world. And changing that system, changing institutional racism is what society with the young girl. You want people people to be able to speak out every time this happens. So we applaud the girls who have taken it upon themselves. But our responsibility as a department of education is not only to listen and to do something about it. Hence I'm saying that the process we've put together to ensure we don't just take an incidents, we also take the whole system to change to ensure that these girls now these young people now who are driving this movement will influence and make it better for the next generation. So we are also acknowledging that we probably have have not done enough, but the fact that we have started instituting a, a, a whole section dedicated to transformation will see that the system changes itself. And uh, that's all we have time for. Uh, uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Naledi uh, Mbute, who is uh, the Eastern Cape Education Department's Chief Director of Communications uh, and, of course, one of the old girls from Clarendon High School in East London, Atambile Masola, uh, where, of course, uh, allegations of racism and discrimination uh, they've put up on social media. Uh, the department says they're looking into that. Uh, uh, they acknowledge the experiences uh, of the girls, and we hope that uh, certainly uh, things at that particular school change 
much in terms of the allegations that have been made by uh, the former learners there, as well as uh, the education department saying it's putting in measures in place currently to ensure that uh, institutional racism is uh, dealt with. Not just an issue there in the Eastern Cape. Uh, just a couple of moments ago, you'd recall, a bit earlier on into the show, we did speak uh, to uh, the Gauteng Education Department here where there was another incident in Pretoria as well.